What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, July 23rd, 2023 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat. Stand up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, China's banking turmoil. 40 banks vanish as crisis deepens. My, oh my, not great news out of China. Staying there. Bad news from China could be harbinger for lower oil prices. We'll fly over to the UK. UK likely to miss its 2030 clean power goal. I- I'm shocked to hear that. We'll bounce over to Russia. They consider building an oil refinery in Cuba. Super interesting. And finally, at home, big tech struggles on path to net zero. Stu will then toss it to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas markets. Mainly, we, we, we saw a decent drop in oil prices today, mainly off the back of some of the political craziness that's happened over here. We do have an M&A deal, Australia's Woodside, to buy tel- Tellurin, and specifically that Driftwood LNG project they have sitting out there. So we will cover that. And then finally, we'll quickly cover on SM officially, announcing an upsized private offering of about $1.5 billion of senior notes, half of them due in 2029, half of them due in 2020 or 2020. 2032 to cover the XCL acquisition. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Let's start with our buddies over there in China. China banking turmoil. 40 banks vanish as crisis deepens. Michael, a financial crisis is never good. Reports from China indicate the collapse of one of the banks, the prime portal, Remando, Rem- R-E-N-M-I-N-B-A-O dot com published a report from outside its headquarters in Zing Bank, which concerned climate cli- clients stormed over bankruptcy rumors. There are 40 banks, 55 trillion won, $7.5 trillion, representing 13% of the country's banking system. Wow. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's, I mean, and the difference is they're so integrated with the government. You know, there's there's something going on from the top down. And and this is why it is incredibly frightening. Whenever you see countries like this in the past where they have banking problems, they go to war. This is frightening. I'm yeah, serious. It, it, it really no, it it really is frightening. And from the standpoint of you know, what this means for energy. I mean, they're a huge, you know, we talk about this every day in the finance section. They're a huge buyer buyer and, and sentiment driver of where prices are going to go. If the Chinese economy doing well, so will oil prices go because they're going to buy more oil. So it's well, going to be super interesting. You've got another one here, you know, specifically, to, I think we well, move into that one. next. That ba- Yeah. Bad news from China it could be the harbinger of lower oil prices. This one was pretty interesting. From the mid-1990s to the onset of COVID to the 2019, China almost singularly handedly drove the commodity super cycle. And this is really important. It looks like May's 5% growth, and it's the second straight month showing a decline. Q2 figures highlight the divergence of growth divers persist. It's bad, dude. The Q2 numbers confirm the momentum of monthly data data per prints on industrial production on non-manufacturing PMI. Yeah, it's it's not good. I mean, to, to, to you layer in some of the stuff that's happening politically here, the markets today have sort of reacted to what's going on with President Biden deciding not to run again. The apparent Trump's going to win in 2024 or, you know, here here in November. What does that mean for for oil production we love oil production that could necessarily mean lower prices so it's as china goes so will oil prices in the terms of if we're going to see rising production here the only way that you know the only positive indicator on the sentiment side for oil prices is going to be where in the international markets are things growing china may be the only place it's going if we're seeing bank collapse and a contraction of their economy oh Hold on to your pants, folks. Yeah, and in the last article, in the last paragraph here, they say they're still buying everything they can from Russia and Iran because they're not buying them in petrodollars. So, and they're buying it at a reduced rate. Yep. And both of those are outside of OPEC, not OPEC plus. 
So, I mean, it's, it's really, I got a, a podcast with David Blackman and Josh um, Young. Thank you. Josh Young on Wednesday to talk about pricing on this. Yeah. The super interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that. All right. What's next. Let's go to UK. I'll tell you what UK likely to miss its 2030 clean power goals. Really? I can't believe this. I am so, I'm so shocked. As part of its ever, efforts to boost clean energy, the UK government lifted the de facto ban on onshore wind, which has been in place in England since 2015. The government has committed to doubling its onshore wind energy by 2030, quadrupling offshore wind and tripling, tripling solar power by the end of the decade. Michael, they're going to go broke. They are, their whole new government is, is brand new and they are absolutely just going to break the UK. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is pretty, uh, you, you got is, this financial times analysis. This just cracked me up. Well, it's, you got this, uh, this is the most English company you'll ever heard of who did this analysis Cornwall insight. <laughs> it's about as English as it gets. It's like a really horrible meal. I mean, it, it's really bland. Must here's the here's the quote from Kate Mulvaney. She's a principal consultant over there at Cornwall Insight. She says that labor, quote, faces significant challenges in reaching their 2030 power decarbonization targets as financial constraints, supply chain challenges, and intense global competition for limited resources po pose hurdles. I mean, there's a three-prong approach there. You, you, you got to have the money to be able to do this. It's huge right. investments. You got to be able to get these these raw materials, a lot of them are coming from Africa. We know what's going on over there in terms of child labor, in terms of unsafe working environments. And, you know, with the amount of subsidies which have gone into this over the years, the massive entrants have flooded the market and it's almost become a dime a dozen to have your own renewables company because why not? You're going to get a nice big government check for that. You know, right. the, the UK Climate Change Committee said, did say last week that its latest assessment showed that the U or did say that the US, the latest assessment showed that the UK is off track for net zero only as a third as only a third of the emissions reductions required to achieve the country's 2030 target are currently covered by credible plans. So even the Climate Change Committee over there says they're not going to work. That's bad. When the climate change police are mattress, you know, confronting the mattress police, mattress tag police, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. All right, let's go to Russia. Oh, this one frightens me, dude. Russia considering building an oil refinery in Cuba. Where would they get their crude? From Venezuela. Or mm. think about it, Russian tankers rolling right on into the off, right off the coast of the U.S. on really horrible old sanctioned tankers meaning uh, waiting for an ecological disaster to happen off the offshore right off the U u.s russia and cuba have discussed the idea of building an oil refinery in cuba with the help of russian companies cuba has a crude oil right it's logical not to import products but to produce them here disagree but they're putting in a Russian crude refinery in Cuba is a bad thing for the U.S. Well, for for security purposes, it absolutely is. I think, you know, from Cuba's standpoint, I actually agree with the sentiment that if we're not going to be able to get our crude oil from Venezuela, we got to get it from somewhere. I mean, what's going on right now is that they're they're having massive fuel shortages. You've seen right. what's the quote in here earlier this year, Cuba, which has seen chronic shortages of gasoline and other fuels said fuel prices would jump by nearly 500 percent. On February 1st, 2024, obviously a lot of that's being subsidized by the government when you can't subsidize because you can't infinitely subsidize things that aren't necessarily making money when you can't, when you, when you don't have other places to bring in those subsidies from that are quote unquote making money. So, you know, this is the only logical conclusion. I do think it's a huge security, not failure, but a, a huge security risk for the United States now that you're, like you said, you're going to have Russian ships being able, you know, coming in and out on a, on a, on a regular yeah. basis. I mean, it, it's all around from the United States perspective, not good, but no. if you're Cuba, For what else Cuban, can you do? You got to get your oil we, from somewhere. I've said this before. I wouldn't want to do business with the United States right now. So you got to do what you got to do to survive. But for the United States, it's not good. No, I'll it's not you, good. 
let's go to the next one here. Big tech struggles on the path to net zero. Net zero is a really a misnomer and a missed target. Before everything got disrupted by the attempt, this is the first paragraph out of the article. Before the everything got disrupted by the attempt on President Trump's life, I had written a post last week at big title, Big Tech on the Path to Net Zero. It really looked substantially at the sustainability reports from Google, Microsoft, and Meta, and all three admit to going rapidly in the opposite direction from net zero as their business models grow into power data. At least they admit it quietly. It, well, it's at least they do. What's funny is I love how they put this out. You know, it's middle of 2024 and Amazon finally just released its 2023 sustainability report. So I, I'd love to be on that team, which could work, which could work that slowly. Yeah, we don't work that way around here. Apple 2030 is our commitment to be carbon neutral for our entire footprint by the end of the decade. We will get there by innovating in at every stage of product life cycle from how they're made to what they're made from that starts with beginning new clean energy online across our supply chain today with more than 320 suppliers we have committed to using renewable electricity for apple production with over 16 gigawatts already online they're avoiding more than 18 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions I love this. Right. Apple's introductory level, introductory level. Apple 2020 or Apple 2030 is our commitment to be carbon neutral for our entire footprint. Notice it's not carbon net zero anymore. It's carbon neutral. neutral. They, they rolled out net zero. That sleight of hand. Remember that for their entire footprint by the end of the decade, we'll get there by innovating every stage of the product life cycle, blah, 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 blah. This is what I find super interesting. Today, more than two. 320 suppliers just have committed to using renewable energy for electrics, Apple production, which over 16 gigawatts already online. They're avoiding more than 18 million metric tons. Okay, get this, Stu. 320 suppliers have committed to using renewable energy for Apple production. So what does that mean? They flip on the wind farm when they're working on Apple stuff. Then when they go to produce other stuff, they flip on natural gas. No, the answer is nobody knows what they're using. It's just they've communicated to that and they sent them a memo and they said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'll make sure it's coming from wind. Oh, yeah, it's there's no clue as to the methodology of how they came up with that line of emissions decreased by more than 55 yeah. percent. There's no way that's a rabbit pulled out of somebody's hat. <laughs> it's it's a good one <laughs> so anyway well that's it for me off to you yeah all right well we'll go ahead and, and pop over and cover what's what's going on in oil and gas finance guys but before we do that we got to pay the bills as always the news and analysis that you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website energynewsbeat.com the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business hit the description below for all of the links to the timestamps links to the articles so you can check us out you can also hit us up on Substack where you can get all the articles that we are going to cover in this in this show as soon as we record it aka the afternoon prior so go ahead and check that out the energynewsbeat.substack.com as always again www.energynewsbeat.com Dot com. You know, oil prices dude, didn't do well today. We'll start with the overall markets, though. S and P five hundred rebounded a little bit after seeing three three days of absolute not carnage, but 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 dropping relative to <laughs> what we would what what what's been going on right now. I mean, markets today up one point, basically one percentage points for the S and P five hundred. Nasdaq was actually up one point five percentage points. Two year yields, ten year yields, fairly flat, with ten year yields outperforming two year yields by three quarters of a percentage point. Uh, Dollar index basically flat. We saw Bitcoin basically flat again, $68,000 after rising a little bit overnight. Crude oil shaves off about three-tenths of a percentage point, but was down below $78 dollars until rebounding recently here in the afternoon. Brent oil actually saw about a one tenth of a percentage point rise, 82.62. Natural gas actually was up five percentage points, two dollars and twenty-four cents. So still still low, but for a variety of reasons. On the oil side, mainly what's happening is the fact that, you know, as 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 markets have fully opened now, it's the sentiment mainly around one what's going on in China, as we mentioned early on in the show, with these banks disappearing with all the 
of turmoil that's going on. A big buyer of international crude. We know they're still buying crude, but the fact that they're not going to be buying, either buying outside OPEC and outside the petrodollar doesn't bode well for, you know, forward looking oils, you know, oil demand sentiment, which is where a lot of this stuff been baked in. And the fact now that we've officially seen President Joe Biden, as we talked about the show yesterday, dropping, pulling his hat out of the race, you know, still a little unclear who's going to be that Democratic nominee. Uh, looks like most people are circling the wagons around the uh, Kamala Harris. The point is, though, the market still thinks, if you look at the betting markets, they still believe, and I think most people would tell you, you know, Trump's going to win in, in in November, and that mixed with China, you're going to see an increase in you see an increase in supply, a decrease in international demand. Well, what does that do for prices? Well, it, it it's going to drop them. So, you know, that I, I think this week or at least today, the sentiment is leaning towards supply up, demand down. That's going to lead to a price fall on the natural gas side, though. Mainly, what we're seeing today is a rebound from uh, refineries and export facilities opening up since Hurricane Bevel. Free Report LNG saw an increase of about I, I was I saw it here earlier. Feed gas was up about 25 percentage points into Freeport down there in Texas, which is basically saying, hey, we're 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 mopping up and, and getting up back off of kind of what what happened in Hurricane Bevel. So mixed with the fact that, you know, we've got a little bit of a heating dip this week, especially in Texas, but the South is about to see throughout August a huge huge heat wave which will most likely drive you know drive power consumption which should bode well for natural gas prices so markets rewarding natural gas prices in that point the other thing we saw us do australia's woodside to buy telrinian this is you know woodside's an australian lng player uh, they go ahead and enter this deal to buy telrinian and specifically their driftwood lng export project which is going on in louisiana this is an all cash payment of 900 wow. million dollars and when you include debt the thing values at about 1.2 billion dollars mainly what they're obviously doing and for this is getting out in front and trying to buy in to this Driftwood LNG project. Now that this LNG, what's interesting is this deal was obviously being negotiated probably prior to the lifting of the export LNG right. ban. Now that that ban is lifted, who knows whether or not this that played a role in this? What what they are saying though is that this was you know this according to a Wood site note this presents a quote attractive entry into an opportunity with more than $1 billion of capital expenditures incurred to date. So what they're saying, they've already spent all this money, so it's great. We can buy in right at the low totem or right before this thing begins right. to you know, finish its you know, final investment decision. What's interesting is that this actually acquisition represents a 75% premium relative to their closing price on July 19th, 2024, and a 48% premium relative to their 30-day volume-weighted Price average, which is absolutely wow. interesting. You know, this, you know, they, they're quoted as saying it's a premier site fully permitted in the advanced stage of its pre FID development with multiple strong relationships. As you guys know, earlier this year, they, Telranian went ahead and actually dumped the rest of their upstream asset, assets to on energy management. They're up here in Dallas that consists of, of most of their or most all of their upstream development stuff which was sitting down there in louisiana some of that haynesville and Bossier shale stuff down there it's about thirty-one thousand acres so that was for about 260 million dollars I, I i here i think it's a great deal i think it's also to, to point out as, as part of this deal or woodside is going to provide a loan to tell you know, basically a loan to themselves of about 230 million dollars to ensure that the driftwood lng site activity and de-risking activities i wonder what that means de-risking activities, but maintain momentum prior to the completion of the transaction. So what this probably means is that Renia needed some cash and they needed to, right. you know, now yeah, I, I think this is a good deal all around. I've said this before, getting in on LNG facilities at this stage is great because it represents a, a, a way to, you, you, your company you're purchasing has already spent a lot of money. You get to come in at the last minute, provide that kind of last little push. I don't know how necessary it is with this, the LNG export ban being lifted, probably not going to come back, but you never know. So super interesting there. The only thing I saw is we officially got some, 
notes out from SM Energy. They announced a private upsize debt offering of about $1.5 billion, half of that due in 2029, the other half due in 2032. And this was to fund the SCL Resources Acquisition, which is a joint venture there from NCAP and Rice Energy partners. You went to Basin, which is actually really interesting. There's there's two notes here. You know, you got 6.7% senior notes, half of that due in 2029. The other half in 2032 is at 7%. So, you know, I mean, that gives you an idea on how much debt debt's costed nowadays. Uh, and, there, and there's definitely a, a little bit of a- uh, 7 trillion a year or something like that. 7 trillion a year. It's not that expensive, but you're definitely- oh, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Stanley Nichols. That's what that's what it is in Stanley Nichols. But this is again assuming the XCL resources close. This has what they call a special mandatory redemption, which means if they don't actually close this acquisition, the bank can go ahead and redeem all this back. You know, I'm generally not a big fan of using debt to go out and make acquisitions, especially when those acquisitions, especially when you got to go spend a lot of capital to actually develop these assets. But I want to throw up this chart here. This is from Ted Cross. He's over there at Novi Labs. We love them over there. It, basically what this chart is showing, XL Energy, this is back when they bought their Uinta, those XCL Uinta assets. But what this showing is that the Uinta Wells, the average Uinta Well, is outperforming both the Delaware, the Williston, and Midland Basin. The, basically, the, the Uinta is slowly becoming and sneakily becoming one of the top plays in the United States. And nice. that's crazy to think about, especially because there's only 283 wells drilled there. So the downside is the sample size is probably maybe smaller than you want. You know, Delaware, as you see down there, has got 11,000 wells drilled. Midland Basin's got 10,000 wells. you got pins only at, you know, 3,600 wells. But you see the average EUR is substantially higher than the Midland Basin, a lot better than the Williston. And slightly better than the Delaware. And right now, all the rage is focused on the Delaware Basin. Big wells are being drilled down there. Right. Pretty interesting. So, you know, knowing this, I don't feel as bad taking debt out to go acquire a company. Obviously, SM's going to, you know, S, you got to fund your acquisition some way. We don't have cash on hand. But, you know, as as I, I'm not as worried, per se, about SM Energy doing this because I, I think they're actually going to see the returns relative to to you know this acreage the key the good thing about xcl is they have some of the best acreage out there in uinta so there is a lot of running room in this deal I, i'm it's pretty fascinating Stu. i again i you know call me crazy i don't actually mind taking out all this debt to fund this because i do think they'll be able to make the money back oh yeah uh, from the way you described it but again, the only way to know is drill wells, and we love that. So we'll we'll definitely be seeing some development there. That's all I've got, Stu. You got anything else for the day? Oh, no. Just buckle up. We're in for a very rough ride. Yes, we are, guys. And we appreciate everybody sticking with us here. But with that, we're going to go ahead and let you get out of here, start your day. Thanks for checking us out here on this gorgeous Tuesday. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. Thank <laughs> you.